Give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. And oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God, oh Jacob. And oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob. Come on, church, sing it out. We bow. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. And oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob. And oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob. song. Let us be a generation that seeks.
on everybody right here. Love on your friends, your neighbors, a stranger.
the least bit pretend or intimate that uh, I have in some way or another never had a problem in my life and that God always takes care of it. And even when it looks bad, I know he's got it under control. No, I know what it is to hit the panic button. I know what it is to lose peace. I know what it is to think, oh man, I would rather be dead right now. I mean, all kinds of circumstances, situations from uh, things that at the time were terrible, like tests at school or uh, passing certain things or job interviews and different things like that to the horrific things of finding out that somebody's health was failing them that I loved or that somebody had been killed or hurt in an accident, etc., etc. So there's all kinds of things that, yeah, I can relate with any one of you and every one of you, but I wanted tonight to show you, scripturally speaking, that um, I think that there's, there's this thing going on behind the scenes that if we believe, we can trust that God's there working whether we see him or not. So if you will, before we look, let's pray and we'll go from there. God and Father, tonight for these, it would, uh, man, in the busyness and the hecticness of both the end of summer, even though we're kind of in the middle of it with school starting next week for a lot of different ones, some here and some going away. God, there's all kinds of things going on. Uh, with work itself, Lord, and uh, taking advantage of the long days to get certain jobs done, and, and if nothing else, being tired because some guys began their day, uh, Lord, even at the crack of dawn, so to speak, because of the heat that could be there. But thanks for, Lord, even there, just the relief today that you would give us way down here in the south, that uh, you'd allow that air conditioner to be turned on in heaven and, and bring it down. We thank you. But God, I just cherish the fact of these that are here tonight and that they would give of themselves. So God, please, please, please don't let me disappoint them, but might I be a tool that I give you to them. You and your word, you and your spirit, you and Jesus Christ, all that goes with our salvation. That I would share and relate it, Lord, in truth, uh, but not in truth that's um, in any way, I don't know, a club upside the head, but rather instead truth that says, come on, look at this. And God, I do pray for us that claim to believe that our belief would increase to the point we allow it to bring us the peace that Jesus, you as the Prince of Peace, brought to this earth. Not a peace that has anything to do with circumstance, that has everything to do with you get the final say. And so God, tonight I pray that in spite of me and my weaknesses and my uh, uh, unlikeliness and inability, God, I pray you show yourself strong. I pray, God, that you would speak things through my mouth that would be designed that the ones that are here would each hear something, God, but not just something, but in a way that, God, that they would believe, how did you know, God? And it's just further proof, Lord, you do. You've got a plan for each one of us, and you're working that plan. God, how much neater it would be if we can cooperate. So I pray that we would learn, Lord, uh, if not from our own lessons of life, we'd learn from the lessons that your scriptures give us of the other people's lives. So God, please grant us insight, give us energy and strength and alertness, help us to have receptive minds, Lord, at this mellow time of the day. Um, that we would be able to, Lord, find out why, one of the reasons why, at least, that you brought us here tonight. But thanks for fellowship, God. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for brothers and sisters that, Lord, take me deeper just by being here. And I, I believe that with all my heart as your spirit, Lord, wants to mine deep down inside of us. And that it's amazing how we as a church, when gathered together, how that happens in a greater way than when we do on our own. So Jesus, be glorified, I pray, with everything we say and do in the name of Christ. Amen. So here in Acts chapter 13, we kind of, Julie was last week like, man, you're doing such a good job. Why'd you go back and go to this other thing? I got kind of confusing there, and I know that you probably think of that too, but I'm not too worried about being confusing. I just want to look at what the scriptures have to say, and I love sharing together or binding or attaching at least Old Testament with New Testament fulfillment to find out that if there's one thing that's halfway true, it is the fact that history does repeat itself. And why does history repeat itself? Because we as human beings aren't very original. I mean, no matter what it is that we think that we've got, there are a few inventions that, yeah, I can't pretend for a minute that uh, there aren't any new inventions, but when it comes to inventing sin, the devil's pretty predictable, and so are we. When it comes to new stuff that we think that we're doing, I mean, it just cracks me up when uh, some of the uh, new generation gets to talking about, and the whole big word out there, you know, is that, that we would be uh, green, Green and this and that, conservative and what we do with the, all the things of the earth that God's given us. And I look back and I, man, I remember my mom washing clothes and uh, uh, she did have a washing machine that dad got her about kid number three or four. I remember that. I was old enough to at least know it was probably kid number four, uh, a washing machine with an agitator in it. Not, not like the washing machines you've seen, but the old kind that you'd roll out, hook the hoses up and all this stuff. And I remember that as I'd watch, because I was thrilled with mechanical things, and as I'd watch that she'd put those clothes in after they'd done this deal here, and then she'd soak them in the rinse tub, and then she would go ahead and run them through what? 
the ringer. The ringer. It wasn't the ringer like the movie. <laughs> that was a little bit weird. It wasn't the ringer like the ring that boxers would stand in. No, instead it was these two things that would push together and squeeze the water out of those things. And she warned me, do not get close to this. You put your fingers in, it'll smash the time out of them. And I'm like, yeah, but can I feed something? Nope, nope, nope. Just leave it alone. So she had that. But then guess where the clothes went after that? Out on the line. They had these wooden things used over and over and over again called clothespins. And they had this wire. And I remember mom had a rag that she would go ahead and put bleach on and go up and down that wire uh, that was going to be where clothes hang outside in the sun that would bleach them and make, the, make them white, you know, sparkly and clean them up and everything, make them smell fresh. Except we had cattle lots and pig lots around, so it didn't do so good on all that all the time. But it just depended on which way the wind was blowing. But, but that's about as green as you get, you know? And yet today, everybody thinks they got the corner of the market on green. I mean, and you know, at night, I mean, we opened the windows. We had a window fan, and we found out if you open uh, or put the window fan in this one window, and you just open one other thing, and it'll draft all the way through the house. Or some people had the ones in the attic, you know, that would pull through. I mean, amazing, right? Not to take any business away from, uh, you know, the Holt brothers here or whatever that way. You know, I mean, I, I'm glad we got air conditioning now, but I'm just saying... There were ways that you could cool off. There were ways that you could go ahead and still, man, there's nothing better than sleeping with a window fan going, right? I just like mine going while the air conditioner's still on. Anyway, so all this stuff. Well, sin's kind of that same way, and God, the way he works, and people, the way we act, it's just not changed much in the 6,000 years of Scripture that we have for us. You know, I mean, it's just amazing, isn't it, how quickly we forget, and we can read something and we forget. And you know me, I mean, I'm all the time trying to tell you that, you know, that uh, if, if there's an epitaph on my, I mean, I've got a lot of things I'd love for you to want to say about me, but on my own, what I would put on my own is that, man, if you're going to go to the school of hard knocks, learn the lessons because tuition is expensive, right? You don't want to take the courses over and over again. And the greatest school that you can go to really is you don't have to pay any tuition. It's learning from somebody else and their stupid things they did, Right? Because if we watch and we become observant, we can see people and go, why in the world do they do that? I want to make sure I don't ever do that. But if you're not careful, you'll end up doing it with them, you know, because it's just that part inside of us that for whatever reason, I don't know why we're so slow. We, we presume we already know it all, number one, but I don't know why we're slow to gain wisdom. And yet in the scriptures, we're told to gain wisdom, to seek wisdom with all that we've got. And it's not so we can be smart and impress people. It's so that we can stay out of trouble. Well, the Israelites, man, God just rescued them from slavery, and it wasn't a slavery that they really did on their own. It wasn't because they'd been bad, as later on we read that, you know, in the Old Testament when he finally just allowed Jerusalem and Judea and Israel just to go ahead and be taken off to Assyria, uh, modern-day Iran area. He just allowed them to because they were unfaithful to him. This isn't that. These guys had just become slaves in the midst of a nation that they'd actually gone to to flee to have food for their protection. Before 400 and some years later, God's bringing them out. Now, he told them that he would, and he did. And yet, at the same time, even though they saw the mighty hand with the plagues and everything like that, we're going to read tonight and see that they're just a bunch of sissies. I mean, it's like, oh, no, here we go. And I mean, it's just the start of it. I am so impressed with Moses. I'm so thrilled. I mean, I, I wish I could tell you that we didn't have a church that ever complained. I mean, it's not that good. But this week it is, right, because we're going to do everything without what? complaining or arguing right how's that going all right yay i mean so far julie hasn't one time had to say i thought you were you know so we're doing good but you know the game's on right and it's why because there's a passage in the scriptures that says do everything without complaining or arguing man what a great novel idea how come it's so hard to do and we're just shooting for a week so let's see what happens between now and sunday but these folks were a bunch of complainers. And I say all this as an introduction. No, it's more an introduction. It's to get us thinking about the fact, what am I like? Do I learn from my lessons? Do I have the wisdom to even learn from somebody else's lessons? Do I listen to God and trust God? Do I understand that there are some things I've gotten myself into that are my problems? God rescues me from that. Do I understand then there are other things that some people's, their problems got me into trouble? Do I understand that God can rescue me there? Do I believe that God's working in my life all the time like he said that he would? All those are big questions to ask, and I think we can see those enacted here with the children of Israel. So what we read again, chapter 13, verse 17, bear with me, as for some we repeat. When Pharaoh left 
Exodus 13, 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God didn't lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up to Egypt or out of Egypt armed for battle. And so it just gives us this little insight to history here and what God did. And I think it's so cool, and we can read over it real fast. It's not tough read or anything in that regard. If they face war, they might change their mind. But what does that show? I think when we stop and look for it or look at it, it shows us that God, God has concern. God is aware of us. He's aware of our strengths and our weaknesses, where we're at. And he saw that here with the children of Israel, that with their newfound freedom, they'd been slaves their whole life. They've got this freedom, and even though they've got gold in their pocket and they've got some animals that they did get to take out, and even though they've got swords or whatever in this regard, that they're not at all ready for facing an army. And I just want to share that with you because God's aware of where you're at. He's equally aware of where we ought to be by now, but he knows where we're at. And when I say where we're at, I realize you're not supposed to end a sentence in a preposition, but he, he's aware at what stage in our life, at what mental capacity do we have, what physical capacity do we have, where do we have strengths that we pretend we don't, and where do we truly have weaknesses? I, I mean, today is a day and age of everybody's feigning disability, and I don't mean everybody is, but it's sad that, you know, you hear on TV the different ones that are found that they were out golfing, or the one guy that ran the marathon, and he's supposedly completely disabled, you know, I mean, or did a triathlon. I mean, there's all kinds of weird stories out there. And what leads people to do that? Because they believe there's something to gain for nothing. And yet we know that most of those things aren't there, but it's sad that the people that need it then get overlooked. We know there's an emphasis on a variety of different things, and it's almost cool to be a victim these days. And I'm not saying that there are no victims. I'm just saying some people really go to any kind of extreme to tell you, oh, how bad their victimization is. But within this, I want you to see here, God knows. And he knows what is real, and he knows what we just aren't sucking it up. And he knows when we don't have the capacity. And he knows what real pain is. Do you ever find that difficult to explain to somebody when you've got one of those migraines or a killer headache to explain to somebody that either never has a headache or doesn't, and they kind of go, oh, yeah, sure you do. You know, I mean, you know that feeling. It's not good. It's, God's not that way. Because when we tell God, and he's invited us to bring to him whatever's going on with our life, but He's sympathetic and empathetic and everything you would want him to be. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that Jesus came to the earth. One of the major reasons he stayed on the earth as long as he did was because he wanted to find out what it was to live in the flesh so he could relate with us. And what the scriptures clearly show is that he is now this great advocate for us before the Father explaining about humanity, about some of the things that really do hurt and some of the doubts that do arise in the way that Satan can battle. And so it's so cool to know that that's Jesus representing us to God the Father. And all I'm saying, what's so sad is, is that we don't find comfort in that. Now, people may not understand and people may roll their eyes, but God doesn't unless God really knows. He knows what you're going through. He knows what brought it on. And he also knows what the remedy is for it. And so in this particular case, he sees the children of Israel. He knows their capacity, their cap capabilities. They're just not ready for war at this point in time. So he takes them in a different direction. What I want you to understand, a big part of this overarching is not necessarily a title, but there is meaning behind God's madness. I mean, it seems like madness at times. I know I've used the illustration before, but it, it really is poignant. It stood out to me when I first saw it described because my grandmother had, and, and I don't even think you can even say where rugs are from anymore because there's somehow some way that it might be uh, insensitive or whatever, you know, but it was made in another country, this rug was, you know, and on the top side, it looked one way, and was kind of cool, even though it wouldn't have been anything I wanted in my room, and it was my great-grandma, she'd done it when she was overseas, she'd bought this thing, and I don't have a clue what that thing might be worth, because it was handmade and everything that way, but at the time, it was just a cool rug that fit in their front room, but on the back side of it, it was like kind of weird, you know, I mean, it wasn't just a juke back, you could see threads and one thing and another like that, it's tapestry, they say, and a tapestry, and some of you ladies that are real creative, and maybe a few of you guys, but, you know, you do that, and it's not knit one, purl two, it's not just crochet or whatever, but it's something like that, you know, and, and, and you, you poke these things through, and there's this and that, and there's fragments on one side, but on the top side, it's like, oh, wow, look at this. 
And I think that's what's so cool about it is that that's what we sometimes go through with life. All we ever see is the bottom side that seems to be helter-skelter and not making much sense. But up above, God knows what he's doing and especially what he's doing with us. And we might seem to be one of these threads out of place down here, but on the other side, God had us put in a particular place at a particular time, I think multiple times through our lives. And if we just cooperate and enjoy, we'd get to see the big picture someday. But right now, we struggle to do that. What I'm saying is God has meaning behind the madness. It seems like sometimes he just indiscriminately, oh, let's just change course here. We're the ones that typically do that. God always has a plan. And what he's doing, he's bringing us into the plan with where we're at, but where he wants us to be. And I don't just mean a location. That's a part of it. But it's eventually in a relationship with him and with people. And the unbelievable thing that Acts 17, 24 and following brings out is at the same time that he's moving me to make an influence on other people, he's moving other people into my life to make an influence on me. But not just me, but every one of us in this room and every one of us in the world. He's doing it to make, help the unsaved get saved. He's doing it to help the saved increase in their walk with him. The whole thing. I mean, that's why there are some people that you just meet that there is a relationship with. I have to be real careful because there's some people that it's like, I don't get it, man. I hope God doesn't have me in their path for very long, but I need them. Sometimes it's to learn from them of of a trait that's mine that I don't realize. Other times it's to learn compassion for them. And everybody's not like me, but that doesn't make them wrong. It's different, but there's a part there I can still learn and work. And that's what God's doing with them. He understands them as a whole, and he understands them individually, and he's still working very individually with Moses, but no more him than anybody here, including Pharaoh, this king of Egypt. So 19 talks about taking the bones of Joseph, then we jump to 20. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert, and by the day the Lord went ahead them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. The presence of God. He knew that they were new in this following him. He knew that they were used to taking orders and God's going to give them some things. But really, instead of driving them like their slave drivers did, that's why you call them slave what? Drivers. He led them. It's why God calls us to be pastors, shepherds, not cattle drivers. I mean, I grew up driving cattle, you know, and stuff like that. We move them from one pasture to another. And, and even with hogs, you kind of herded them and you had to drive them along the way. But sheep, you could get out in front and lead and they would follow. And that's what God wants to do with his people. And so he's trying to do that with them. And he's given this cloud during the day that was unmistakable that upwards of four million people could see no matter where they were. And at night, it was a pillar of fire that could be scary, except how cool would that be when you're out in the middle of nowhere you've ever been, no lights, no nothing, no water, and God's there. So God did this to benefit them so that they could travel by day or night. And he stayed in his place. He kept that going for them. Then chapter 14, the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back to encamp near pi Hahara through Megiddo, Megiddo, Migdal, excuse me, and the sea, there to encamp by the sea, directly opposite of Baal, Zephon, Pharaoh will think. And this is where it shows, so he's doing this with them, But again, the madness behind or the meaning behind the madness, it's not that God just, oh, let's do this. I don't have my GPS working, but let's try it over here. It's not that. God's thinking of them and he's thinking about this situation because he's knowing what's going on back at the ranch. And so he said, Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion and hemmed in by the desert. One, God knows what we think. You can tell a lot about where you're at in your relationship with him by does that bring you comfort or does that bring you ooh? Comfort if we know we're walking with him, we're open before him, an open book and enjoying that fellowship with him. Panic if we know that we claim we are, but we really aren't. That we're either thinking, doing, or otherwise things that he just wouldn't approve of, that his word, it doesn't line up. It gives us that flinching feeling and we don't need that. Instead, we can have that faithful feeling just, okay, God, I might want to panic, but I trust you here. God knew what Pharaoh would think. And so he's setting him up. Uh, We've got some people in here in the church that they play poker. (gasps) Not me, man. I do slots, not, no. Um, They play poker. And, you know, I just have never either had enough money or enough guts to do it because it's just, I'm afraid my hands would get sweaty and this and that. But, but I know that a part of playing poker is what? It's not having a tell on one hand you don't want to unless you want to create what? The illusion that you do have a tell, right? So you set somebody up. 
I mean, the straight face thing, everything like that, the bluffs, all these things come into play. Well, God's kind of that same way. If he has a tell, it's so that he can eventually use it. And here in this case, he does care very much about Pharaoh and all of Egypt. He could have wiped them off the face of the earth, and he didn't. He could have just given the children of Israel Egypt. He didn't. Why not? Because that wasn't his promise to Abraham. He said it's going to be over here, this area that right now that they're fighting in there around Gaza and everything. He gave them that. He told Abraham, I'm going to give you wherever you walk. He told Jacob, I'm going to give you wherever you walk. And they walked a lot as they moved their, their sheep from one place to another. And he said, I'm going to give you all this. I'm going to give it to you. And so his, he's still going to hold up to his word. Why that spot can't begin to tell you. But he called it a land flowing with uh, milk and honey and all. But, but God's got this plan. But God also knew that Pharaoh had a plan. God tried to appeal to Pharaoh through all that he did. And Pharaoh's heart just kept getting harder and harder, more and more stubborn, hard-headed, bull-headed, you know, stiff-necked, whatever you want to call it. And, and he became a man that was a liar. He would say, I'm sorry, but he wasn't. He would say, I'll do this, and then he didn't. And so it was increasing his insanity almost, so to speak. And even here, you know, that night when he finally brought about the death angel, and only if you had the blood of the lamb over your doorpost were you spared, Pharaoh's household was hit with this. He was overwhelmed like the rest of them and said, get out of here. Here's gold. Take off. Get out of here. Finally, go worship your God, whatever, but just leave us alone. But already the wheels have started turning. I can relate because there's times that, oh, I have repented so wholeheartedly, at least I felt. But as I shared with somebody this last week, I found that there's a huge difference because you see it in others and then you learn it about yourself between repentance and remorse, right? Remorse is what? Typically, it's, I'm sorry I got caught. Repentance says, I'm sorry I even did that. I'm remorseful and repentant, meaning it's changed my mind. I don't ever want to participate in that again. The other says, ooh, what do I need to do to get out of this the quickest? The other part can hardly ever quit saying, I'm sorry enough, right? And I'm not saying that we have to fall all over ourselves again and again, telling God how sorry we are about something that happened back here. I'm just saying that that's what repentance does. Judas had remorse. He hung himself. Peter had repentance. It wasn't easy, but he faced Jesus again, and Jesus made it for, for face to face so that he had to, and he restored him to the kingdom in that regard. So I want you to know that God is aware of us. Pharaoh had remorse, but man, after he gets to think about it, it starts stirring within him again, and it looks like God's doing it all, but I don't think it's just that, but I think that God took advantage of this hard heart. Verse 4, he said, I'll harden Pharaoh's heart, and he'll pursue them, but I'll gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. When God talks about gaining glory for himself, he's not talking here about, yeah, man, it'll put me up in lights. God's glory is always a desire to share with others. And so what he's wanting to do here is to let the world know, I really am the God. All these things I'm going to tell Moses and are going to be written down for the centuries and millenniums to come, it's because I want you to know I really am God. I don't want you to bow down because I make you. I want you to bow down because you want to. I want you to bow down because it will work well for you. I've got a plan for you. I want you to know that all these commands, they may be difficult, but they're not. They're the best for you because you'll have no regrets living this way, but you will regret if you do your own thing. And I don't care whether we're Americans or we're some other nation or whatever it might be. God has a plan and he cares and he wants us to know that he really is God. All those plagues and stuff were to prove, I can give, I can take away. Here, you want frogs? When do you want them removed? Okay. And he did this back and forth, and Pharaoh seems to just be clueless to it because Pharaoh is almost jealous, I think. He wanted that same control, but even his wise men couldn't duplicate everything. And so what we have going on here is God's trying to gain glory, but the glory is not for himself because God's got this ego that has to be fed. His glory is so that he can really get the Egyptians to say, Wow, why do we worship these other gods that can't do anything? They couldn't spare us or save us. But look at what the God did for these, these slaves, these stupid slave people. Look what he did for them. And the same way then for the children of Israel, God's trying to get their attention saying, look, man, I'm not a tyrant. I'm not wanting to become a new Pharaoh to you to make you work for me. I want you to work for yourself and I want you to be able to enjoy my blessings. That was a God's desire. That's what it is to get glory for him. When we grow up in Christ, guess what? It's the same for us. For me, preaching, it's not to have my name in lights. It's not to have glory for myself and people. Oh, Steve, 
No, man, the coolest thing is, is when you see God and go, whoa, God. And then you say, if Steve can do it, I can do it. If God can use Steve, he can use anybody because that's the way it is. I was sharing with somebody and Julie's pushed me for years and I, I'm still afraid to say it. And I want your prayers, but I don't because I struggle, but I feel that stirring inside that I'm supposed to write. I'd rather talk. And I know that there are dragons speaking and all this other stuff, but that just sounds bad. Satan's a dragon, right? But, you know, you can do these certain programs that will go ahead and put your words down. And, and, but I just, as I keep trying to come up with something that's like, can I just use one of those pseudonyms, God? You know, the, somebody else's name or a fake name or whatever and not be me. Because I really, I, I just want people to read it. I'll tell you what I want to be right now. If I write, it's going to be that uh, ordinary guy. <laughs> because I love that passage in Acts where they said, these are unschooled ordinary guys. These are unschooled ordinary men. You know, I just want it to be that. It's just, I'm, I'm a nobody, but I'm a somebody because God will use me. The same somebody anybody can be. But it's not a potentate. It's just really just a one of you type thing. So back to this story. So God's aware of Pharaoh. He wants to gain glory for himself. And he says, I will gain it. And all his army and the Egyptians will know I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. They followed him. When the king of Egypt was told the people had fled, Pharaoh's officials changed their minds about them. They said, what have we done? We let the Israelites go. We've lost their services, meaning we lost our slaves. So he had his chariot made ready. He took his army with him, took 600 of the best chariots. Uh, one version I read said it was his war chariot, and he took 600 of the best war, but all the other chariots too, because they're going to chase down these millions, a couple million people here. They're going to chase them down and bring them back to work. So everybody's out there, and they're riding like crazy to go get them. You know, the Israelites were walking. They got women and children and kids. They got animals of all different ages, and so they kind of are going slow. Here comes Pharaoh, you know, coming along. And so you can see this building up, okay? And I don't remember, it's been too long since I watched the black and white version of the Ten Commandments, so I don't remember what happened there. But anyway, they're, they're chasing them down. Verse 8 says that uh, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. In other words, he turned him loose and just let him, the insatiable appetite for revenge or whatever it was, God didn't try to hold it back. He just said, man, you'll destroy yourself. Go ahead, go for it. I believe every one of us is born not only as a human being, but with the hand of God upon us, made in his image. I believe every one of us, God puts his grace around us even before we ever come to him. And we sing amazing grace. I mean, if it weren't for that, I can't imagine how terrible we'd be. And I think sometimes when we hear about these very vile people, and whether, especially if it's children and preteens, where did that come from? It's those that Satan's been able to grab quickly. Not because God's grace wasn't there, because they shoved it back. And I think that we all have had times that we'd have to admit that I've ignored God's grace and I did what I wanted to do anyway, right? And it's just a dangerous thing because uh, Saturday, uh, um, when we had our men's breakfast a couple weeks ago, I shared out of the book of Judges with Samson. And what happened with Samson? He kept infringing upon that grace. He kept doing what he felt like doing. And what happened? And everybody thinks that Samson lost his strength because he what? Cut his hair cut, of course. That's what the story says. No. If you read there, when they cut his hair off, it was the last of his vow. The spirit left him. But he said to himself, I will go out as I did before. And he didn't know the spirit had left him. The spirit left him. That's what happens when we, like Pharaoh, not just hot pursuit of the Egyptians, pursuit of our own desires and what we think we want especially if we're wanting control. And so what I think is vital to see here is that's what Pharaoh's doing. He's got this insatiable appetite. Do you have one? Some people have recognized that we call them addictions. Others have kind of remorsefully said, I've got an addiction, but never attacked it, you know? I, I just think that it's interesting how we open Pandora's box and we do think we can close the lid, but there are some things that are very difficult, if, imp- if at all possible. But God, see, is aware of it And he doesn't just say, fine, that's what you'll get what you deserve. But at the same time, there's a certain part of it because he leads us instead of driving us that we've got free will. We can do what we want. Pharaoh's doing what he wants. As you read it, it seems like God's making him do it. But I promise you, I don't believe it's in the least bit that God's making him do this. It's just stepping back and saying, I'll just remove my grace and let you do whatever you want to do, man. 
I don't want that to happen in my life. Do you? Did you know that we're supposed to be grace agents in each other's lives? And I'm not talking about me being in your business or you being in mine. I'm just saying that as we see, we should care enough to speak up. Parents, you know what that's like. You're not invited in, but somehow you try to suggest and you hope somebody else will. But finally, there comes a face to face. You have to, man, I don't know if you're, you're heading down a reckless course. I remember mine wasn't even that reckless other than in my dad's eyes when I was 18 and just graduated that summer, I thought I was taking it off because I wasn't going to work for dad on the farm. And I was out polishing my new Honda 750 and the chrome was shining just good. And you got to remember, I mean, this is tough because we had a gravel driveway. And dad usually when we pulled in the driveway and he'd leave to go after lunch, go back to the field or whatever it was. He'd back out this way and go this way. This time he comes around this way. We had a horseshoe drive, and he's coming up around there. And as he's doing, I'm thinking, what in the world? What are you doing that for, man? You're going to try to slow down just a little bit. You're stirring the dust up on the gravel there. He, mm, and he wasn't slowing down until he hit the brakes. <laughs> well, now it's a cloud of dust. And then he backs up and makes more dust. <laughs> he gets out of that truck, and he said, I don't know what you're planning on doing this summer, but you're not going to spend the whole summer doing nothing. You're going to come to work for me, or you better go get a job like, what the crud, you know, I'm a senior, man. Dad, don't I get a little break here in the action? Now? I'll go to school this fall. And I went down that day and got a job because I'm bound to determine I'm not going to work for him. Worked the hardest I've ever worked in my life. Hired on with a crew for the telephone company, and we dug the post holes, the holes for those great big poles, you know, the 30, 40-foot poles that you couldn't get a machine into. So we had to cut through stuff to get down in there and then clear it and then dig down, you know, 12, 13, 14 feet to plant one of those posts and then tamp it back in. But I was proving to my dad, man, I'm not working for you. I've got to go get a real job, you know. And, but it was that way. Now, what was dad doing? Well, he was intervening because he knows idle hands, devil's playground, all that. He also knew it was a pride thing, and it just was irritating him that I was doing nothing because life's not made up of that, and he didn't want me to get on the wrong course. I share that with you because God's the same way. He wants to... But if, if we persist and insist, he'll let us go. And it's not a good fa- feeling to be free-falling with God's arms not underneath you. And uh, Anyway, so Pharaoh's doing this. He's going headlong into it. God knows what's going on. But God not only knows what's going on with Pharaoh, he knows the Egyptian or the, the Hebrew people here. But God not only knows that, he knows the future. And had he not set up this little scenario, what do you think? How far would Pharaoh have chased them down? There'd been no end to it. I don't care if they'd have gone the straight route too. What would have happened was you'd have had the Egyptians slaughtering the Israelites in front of the Canaanites and the Perizzites and all those other people over here Then the land of flowing with milk and honey. They could have gone straight there. A couple of days or a week been there. But instead, God took them and made it look like they were wandering because he wanted to bait Satan. He gave them a tell and, Satan, or, and Pharaoh bought into it. And so he follows and he pursues them And he doesn't understand, Pharaoh doesn't understand that he's just leading them into their demise. But God's taking advantage of this headlong thinking, and he's also going ahead and protecting his people that said, we want you to lead us. We want your promises. So I want you to see all that because as we read on down through here, you're going to see change. It doesn't look like that. So we read verse 8, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. Again, one of the explanations for that word there is victoriously. They felt like, hey, look what we did. We got out of there. We got stuff. I don't know where we're going to spend this gold, but we got it, man. You know, someplace out here in the desert, you know. We got gold. We got animals. We got our family. We got a cloud up there. I don't think they're thinking about God so much. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, Couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. No. And the chariots, horsemen, and troops pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near this pie, whatever it's called, opposite of Baal, Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, now it doesn't mean they overtook him in the sense that they rode up into their midst and started slaughtering them. It just means now they could see them. Oh, now they're within striking distance. Now there's no way that on foot that they can outrun them. So here it is. So your soldier, your Pharaoh, you're greedy. You're going to get even. You don't want to kill them, but man, you're going to make them wish that they were dead and you're going to bring them back, right? So as Pharaoh approached, verse 10 said, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were what? My Bible says terrified. Anybody else got anything else? 
They're terrified. They cried out to the Lord. They're scared. They said to Moses, and this is where it goes from being terrified to being acoustic, to being doubters. They said, was it because there were no graves in Egypt you brought us to the desert to die? Golly, where'd that come from? It comes when all you can think about yourself. And this isn't the first time they do this over and over again. Notice what they go on to say. Um, what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Now, the reason I brought out that thing about, you know, victoriously or the boldly thing was victoriously. I mean, they were feeling pretty good till they see the Egyptian army. And suddenly it's like, they don't feel so good. But they were feeling great. I mean, this is cool, man. We got it made. This is so cool. The cloud at night, it's fire. God's good. We're going to go. He's going to take us to a place. We're going to have our own houses. We're not slaves anymore. We got gold. We got our animals. And you might not think that sounds like much, but that's what's crazy about it. I don't care what part of the world you live in. We all have things that are of value that if we have and somebody else doesn't, <laughs> it just makes us pretty cool, right? And that's the way they felt. They felt cool until this. And now then, I mean, nothing being said, but now then it's like, <laughs> we told you, didn't we? Leave us alone. Let us just serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Why? There's a lot of times in Scripture people want to die. Elijah wanted to die. Jezebel was ready. But Elijah ran from Jezebel because he wanted to pick how he died. We're that way. Oh, I could just die. Well, yeah, you could. I could. Any one of us could tonight. But, but yet there's a thing coming. God save me. You know, I mean, that's not the way I want to die. It's weird, isn't it? Somebody says, I, and then they find out and they go to the doctor. It's like, oh, no, no, I don't want anything to happen to me. You just said you wanted to die. We are so nuts, man. I mean, it's just really, really crazy. And that's what it shows here. And all I'm saying is, so can we learn anything from them? At least keep our mouth shut. Secondly, that what was the problem here? What's going on? If you got time with me, if you don't, you know, go back to sleep. But if you got time, let's go back here to the book. You know, let's go to Mark, if you will. I think it's chapter four that I had in mind. I didn't mark it. That's terrible. You didn't mark Mark. Uh, Mark, chapter four, please. You got that, didn't you? <laughs> it's a tongue-tied dog. Mark, Mark. <laughs> I, that is really bad, but that's okay, man. I mean, I am focused. I'm waiting for you to catch up. I said, got it. Okay. Mark chapter 4, verse 38. All right. 35, 35. That night when evening came, he said to the disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along. That just cracks me up. They took who along? Jesus. Yep, they took Jesus along just as he was. What's that mean? I have no idea. I guess he looked the same as he always had. I don't know. It's just a strange phrase, right? They took him along. Okay, come on, Jesus. We'll let you go with us again, you know? Just like you are. Maybe that's where they coined the phrase, just as I am without one plea, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up. That part's not funny. A furious squall is as bad as it gets. Came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern. Last I know... Howard sleeps in the front of the boat, right? Up there in the stern. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, most intelligent thing they could ever say, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Do you think anybody had any thought? I mean, if you just think for a minute, how intelligent is it to be a human being? You've seen Jesus do miracles, feed 5,000 people, whatever it might be. And you go to him and dare to say, don't you care? And nobody cares any more than Jesus. Now, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have ever said that? God, don't you care? We, I mean, these are grown men acting like little sissies again. And my whole point being is, yeah, that's easy for me to say because I'm not out there in the furious squall. But what I really want to, think is let's analyze this a little bit Sherlock let's go ahead and get out the magnifying glass and look at this I mean what's their thing based on one thing 
emotion and fear. Now, I mean, granted, they're sail, a lot of these guys were sailors. I mean, they were fishermen. They knew what it was, and they knew it was a dangerous situation. The guys that weren't were panicked because they knew it must be dangerous. Boom, the waves are crashing, and it's like, why isn't Jesus doing something? He must really be in a deep sleep. But the truth of the matter was they started thinking in what? Earthly terms and emotional situations, not faithfulness. They didn't stop and say, who's down there that we brought along with us? Good thing we brought him along just as he is. I mean, that just cracks me up. Bring him along just as he is. Good thing we had room for Jesus, you know. I mean, we stuck him up in the front of the boat. But yeah, it's a good thing you had room for him. He's a good one to take along with you. It's as ignorant as you and me when we're going on a trip saying, pray for travel safety, but we'll go downtown Atlanta and not think about it. Is it because there's no way that there's going to be an accident between here and Atlanta? No, we ought to always, you know, pray about safety, but maybe we ought to just always thank God that you're going with me, Lord. I'm taking you along just as you are because I want you with me. But then we hit the panic button and forget that Jesus is with us or we forget who Jesus is. Does it make any sense? I know I don't, but does this make sense? It doesn't make sense to me that these disciples that believe in him are suddenly acting as though he can't do anything. And it doesn't make sense to me that they forgot who he was. Other than as a human being, when I forget who he is and forget that he's promised, never will I leave you, Steve. Never will I forsake you. Jesus ever lie? Nope. The scriptures even say it's impossible for God to lie. It's against his whole character. So why don't we believe him? That's the question. Why don't we? The next question is, what would it take for us to believe him? Well, maybe if he proved it. Anybody here that's not at least seen one miracle? God do something that you thought there was no way anybody could get you out of? A job when you thought there were no jobs available or a, a fever that broke when you didn't believe that your baby is going to make it through the night? I mean... Or a car wreck that you just drove through that other people are smashed up in and you just drove through it? I mean, if, if I look back just driving alone, I've told you before, I should have been dead a hundred times. I've seen the hand of God. I don't believe I'm lucky. I don't believe at all. I just believe God's not done yet or I wasn't ready. And yet I think I'm ready, but I don't know he does. Maybe I'm not ready totally in my relationship with him, because I do believe there's far more I can build in it, but maybe I'm not ready because I've not completed my mission. That's what I really believe, because God has certain things marked out for us. But, you know, my prayer is, take me, God. Take me when my death will do more to win people for you than my life. But I don't want to be, this is what my prayer is not, I don't want to be one of those go, where are you, God? Don't you care? And I understand, and I don't mean to in the least bit be boisterous and sarcastic towards you that you would ever doubt it's just to me it's the most illogical thing we can do if we are a christian it's totally against faithful thinking and it's totally against believing that god cares and i don't know any way that jesus could have shouted out loud and stretching his arms out on the cross saying i love you this much i'm dying for you but we hit the panic button instead of taking a hold of the peace. We look at our own selves and our own strength and our own weakness and our own how big our storm is instead of looking behind the tapestry and saying, how's it look up there, God? I'm sure glad you're large and in charge. I'm just saying there's moments we could have peace, but instead we, we panic. The, Israel, or the Egyptians or the Israelites, excuse me, are doing that with the Egyptians. They're hitting the panic. Oh, Moses, why'd you even bring? We could have died in Egypt. We told you to leave us back there. And it's like, wow. It sounds like something a three-year-old would say. You don't love me, Mommy. Or you'd let me have that candy right now. And it can get irritating, but they're three. When you're 33 and 34, when you've been with Christ for 30 years, I mean, and you're still, oh, don't you care? I mean, I'm just saying, right? So can we learn from their mistakes? Because the truth of the matter was, Jesus what? Did care. And not only did he care, he couldn't have cared more. 
and he cared enough to let them experience it so they would be able to see what he had planned. And that's the part that I want you to know is I think that the shame of it all is is that God, have you ever ruined a surprise? I've had my share of ruined surprises because, oh, what are you doing? Nothing. Well, it sure looks like you're doing something. Are you sure? I mean, Julie finally quit trying to surprise me because, you know, I'd either try to figure it out or put two and two together or whatever. Sometimes it's just nice to be what? Surprised. But to figure it all out, it's not. But what's even worse is to ruin the surprise by being, you know, aggravated and irritated about it and making a scene, right? Because people that try to create surprises usually go into a lot of planning and they're doing the best that they can. And they want to surprise you because they want you to be pleased. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to please us. Why? Our job is to please him, but why does he care about me? He can't help it. He cares about everybody. And nobody any less than me or more than me. And we ruin his surprises. We ruin what he's got planned. He's the greatest with the punchlines. He's the greatest with the punches. He's the greatest as we looked last Sunday. He can take that which is nothing and do something with it. What were you when he called you? You were nothing, 1 Corinthians 1 says. But he called you and said, I want you on my team. He can take that which is wise to the world and shred it. And the world today is always telling us about what we need and what's the best. And pity you guys going to school at college, you know, because that's going to just fill your mind with everything except truth. And the funny thing is, we'll buy it because my professor said, this book said, well, what about this book? It stood up for how many thousand years right now? And the professor's book, golly, it might be 30 years old. Even what's his face's theory of evolution, man. I mean, it disintegrates itself because it says, if you can prove this, and DNA is proven, evolution doesn't work the way he said that it did. But there's not going to be a professor telling you that. Why? Because they're not God. They're not going to be honest. They want to be God. You know, I've been fortunate to have a few doctors that were just cool guys. They didn't think they were God. And they tell you the truth. They tell you, here's what your odds are. I mean, it cracked me up when the guy told Julie. She goes, that's good news. She goes, well, your husband's still got a life-threatening disease. <laughs> You don't have to say it like that, man. Can you be a little more gentle, you know? It's like, I just like frankness sometimes. Go ahead, Frank, tell me. What do you think, you know? I think you got, you know? And, and it's, but God, I mean, he wants to tell us the truth, but he loves to still surprise us. And we ruin the surprises by being babies that pout or, oh, I'm, I'm uh, hyperventilating because I don't know how we're going to handle this. And, and God's going, you can't. Uh, but I'm here. I promised I loved you. I promised I'd never leave you or forsake you. I mean, I'd go on. I mean, I know. I go back and reread Romans 8 because it's like, all right, I'm going to keep that in mind. What's the Romans 8 one to talk about? It has several different things in it, but it's the one that's verse 28 says what? Uh, God is working all things to good. He's literally at work. He's manipulating and massaging. He's bringing it about. He's playing poker, man. He's got the straight face on going, watch this. God's working all things good. And all he asks that we do, if you read that passage, is what? Love him. That's the number one thing. Any reason to love God? I mean, come on. No one to ten. Got any reason to love God? Early in Romans, I think it was really talking about Jesus quite a bit, so that's probably a good reason to love him. If God loved us while we we're still sinners, how much more now that we love him, right, or we've accepted his son? So he said, love me, and then the second part is called according to what? His purpose. For all of us, yeah, but for me, for each of you individually. I think that's the problem. I think we want to have our purpose we don't want to always really know what his purpose is for us. And that's why we don't feel protected. The closer I've walked to his purpose, the more it's like, oh, well, 
What's the worst thing that can happen to me? Deny the faith. Dying is not on the bottom or the top of that list of the worst things that can happen to me. Denying the faith, it's the worst thing that I could do. Outside of that, the next worst thing is not believing he cares. And that's pretty close to denying faith, I think. Because that's what all the faith is about, is that God couldn't care more for us. But if you keep on reading there in Romans 8, and I'm running out of time, so we'll read it. <laughs> oh, there's meaning in my madness, yeah. Because I don't want you just to stop with that one, and I don't want you to have this passage so you can use to stab somebody else in the eye with. I want you to have this so you grab onto it and say, I don't want to forget this, self. Self, remember this. Memorize this. this is good wor- these are good words. So he says, and we know that in all things God works, in Romans 8, 28, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God, who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to what? The likeness of his son. Yeah, I plan on preaching part of this on Sunday, but to be conformed to the likeness of his son. That's his plan for us. And there's a part of it that's like, that's cool. I'm going to be like a son of God. Yeah, he said you are. You know what's bad? What happened to the Son of God? Rut row. Well, I don't want that part, God. No, man, that goes with it. Paul embraced it. He said, I want to know Christ, and I want to know him in his death and even the resurrection. So he goes on from there. For those God, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of the Son. And those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. What shall we say in response to this? To the Son of God and God the Father would do this? Well, if God's for us, then who the crud can be against us? Crud is in the Greek there, I'm sure. You know, if God loves us, uh, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son, that's how much he loved us, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with Jesus, graciously give us what? All things. You can't get a more upper sermon than that, folks, unless you only want your things. But faith says, cool, God's going to give me all things. Who will bring against a charge against those whom God's chosen? It's God that justifies. Who is it that condemns? Well, Christ Jesus that died more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he's interceding for us. So Paul goes on, he said, so what in the world could separate us from the love of Christ? Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. Those are all pretty big deals. And the answer is what? No, none of it. None of it. His love is greater than every one of those things. So Paul says, for your sake, we face death all day long. And this is that consideration he puts in. Man, in reality, I'm just a sheep being led to the slaughter because we're all going to die, and I'd rather die for Christ than just die. These stupid Israelites, why don't you let's go back to Egypt and die there? Well, why don't you die doing something for God? Death's death. What difference does it make? We might get to face that in this country someday. You've heard about the Iraq, Iraqi Christians, right? Mosul, since shortly after the time of Christ. Get out of here. Your house is mine. Deny Christ, and you can stay. They're leaving. Knowing all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. So... Extra credit, you can go back and read 1 Peter 5, 7. I don't know who's going to get the credit, but <laughs> I'm not passing out grades, but you'll enjoy it. Cast all of your burdens on him because he couldn't care more for you. Not couldn't care less, couldn't care more. So, man, I'm just like, wow, can we learn from other people's mistakes? Wow, can we begin to believe that God's a whole lot more consistent than we are? And wow, if we're going to be the children of God, why don't we become more consistent? Why do we hit the panic button every time? Because we think it's all about us. Lord willing, we get to come back next week. We'll read there where it said that uh, what he had in mind to do. And Moses said to them, would you just stand back and let God fight for you? Would you? And, I mean, there's times we need to do something, and there's other times not. What's that prayer of serenity say? I don't have it written down, but what is it? Help me to 
change, change and accept the things that I can and, and the wisdom to know <laughs> the difference, right? What you can do that I can't and believing that God will. And that's what it boils down to is if you can do something about changing your situation, they'll change it. If you're literally in an impossible situation, relax. You can't do anything. And that's a hard thing sometimes to grasp and to realize, but that's when you can just do the nesty plunge into the arms of God. Remember that, that old commercial? Just falls back in the water. Just, okay, God catch me. And I'll tell you what, you can play that with him, that game with him of trust. He'll catch you every time.